Today we're taking a look at 2016's Clown Town, a movie that begins by stating that it's inspired by true events. A statement that would usually cause me to roll my eyes and sigh, but after the great clown panic of 2016, honestly, anything's possible at this point. The movie starts by introducing us to a babysitter putting kids to bed at the Strode residence, a babysitter that's almost certainly about to meet a rather grisly demise. Not just because this is a horror movie, and horror movies really do have a thing for offing young women, but this is the Strode residence, as in Laurie Strode from Halloween, and that kid's wearing a clown costume, as in young Michael Myers killing his entire family wearing a clown costume in Halloween. She's picking up the kid's toys, and comes across a necklace with the words Caitlin on, before proceeding to put it down on the kitchen counter, where the local paper just happens to be open on the exact page where it's detailing the disappearance of a young woman named Caitlin wearing the exact same necklace. After hearing a strange noise, the babysitter turns around to see one of the children, Ricky, standing there in a clown costume, looking all weird as if he's either about to horrifically murder her or tell her that he's wet the bed. Well, neither, as he runs straight past her and up the stairs, causing her to follow to be inevitably turned into Caitlyn 2.0. And that's exactly what happens after opening one of the bedroom doors, because suddenly she's attacked by a cleaver in a suspiciously low down position, meaning there's a psycho clown kid in the house, or a little person who really doesn't like babysitters. It then skips ahead 15 years, because it's really gotta milk those Halloween references, and we see a group of friends enter a diner as they're passing through the area on a way to a concert. Brad Sarah, Mike and Jill. But before that, we've got to skip ahead to the sponsor of today's video because I've really got to milk these ad opportunities. This video is sponsored by State of Survival, a zombie themed survival strategy mobile game that is free to play and available on iOS, Android and Windows. Starting from now until September, State of Survival is teaming up with the UFC to bring the most exciting in-game activities to all UFC fans and State of Survival players. Download State of Survival now and you'll be able to receive 400 UFC free traits to help you level up more easily than ever. In State of Survival, each hero has his own background story and unique skills. Use exclusive MMA Hero Magnus to defeat zombies and enemies more easily than ever. State of Survival has an immersive and authentic post-apocalyptic worldview and a game story which is full of twists and turns. If you love authentic post-apocalyptic experiences, you should check out State of Survival. So click the link in the top of the description or scan the QR code that's on screen right now to enter the event page. Download State of Survival now to join the Battle Power leaderboard. You'll have a chance to win a 2021 Apple MacBook Pro and other prizes. And don't forget to use the 400 UFC free crate to help you upgrade your basement and level you up faster than ever. Brad and Mike head off to the restroom to compare sizes, where we see that Brad is planning on proposing to his girlfriend Sarah, a plot point that I'm absolutely certain will definitely play a role in this story somehow. A local overhears them talking about trying to get to Columbus, and gives them directions, all while staring directly into the chest of Sarah as her boyfriend stands right there. Brad's not too keen on this guy's oogling eye condition known as I can't stop looking at your girlfriend's breasts, and decides to stand between the pair, right before the sheriff intervenes before anything can happen between them. The sheriff apologises about the locals and decides to give the group a better route due to there being construction being done along the other one, but he does warn the friends that it's incredibly easy to get lost heading that way. We then see the breast staring man walking directly down a railway track because I guess the thought of boobs just overrides his ability to be health and safety conscious, when all of a sudden he's attacked and has a crowbar thrust into his neck damn boobies causing him to be distracted. After driving for a while, the group of friends pull over after realising that Jill doesn't have her phone anymore, and the last place that she saw it was back in the diner before creepy boob man approached them, and after Sarah rings it, someone answers and they're given directions and told to meet at a nearby town. But once they get to said town, they realise that there's not a single soul to be seen, as well as not a single bar of cell reception to be seen either. We then see two guys driving stoned and drunk, before pulling over for one of them to relieve himself, but we suddenly see the man wielding the crowbar standing directly behind the car, looking to kill some more booby daydreamers, before seemingly disappearing as the vehicle drives away. At this point, the group of friends have been waiting around in this empty town all day, waiting for this guy to show up. 
and without seeing a single soul since they arrived, decide that it's best if they just leave and try and get to the concert. But once they do get into their car, they realise that it won't start, as we see a shadowy figure quickly walk by the window. They pop the hood and notice a large chunk of wires have been cut, and I'm no mechanic, but I don't think cut wires equals brum brum. They suddenly spot the man who walked past their car, and after trying to approach, he rather rudely ignores them and walks off into the darkness. They decide to head off on foot, and after walking for a while, Jill spots a large man wearing clown face paint while wielding a machete, aka a really bad time. Suddenly, a car veers off the road after almost driving into Jill. It's the drunk stone dudes too drunk and too stoned to notice the woman standing in the middle of the road. And after they jump out of the car, the magically disappearing crowbar guy magically appears out of the back of the truck and beats one of the men over the head, as everyone watches on in sheer confusion at the sight of some crazy dude hiding in trucks and disregarding health and safety measures while swinging tools around the place. When suddenly, another terrifying man in clown makeup appears, wielding a flaming baseball bat, because sure, if you're gonna hit someone with a bat, why not make it burn too? He walks over to the beaten man, stamps on his head, douses him in gasoline, and drops a lit rag. Because screw this guy in particular. Along with their new friend, they're forced into a scrapyard after the large clown appears again, and they're all forced to hide in an abandoned school bus. And as they're hiding in it, one of the clowns comes directly up to the window because apparently he's got a thing for creepily staring into children's school buses and leaves with somehow not noticing the group of five people directly below him in an otherwise empty school bus. As they move on, Jill is grabbed from behind without the rest realising, and when they do realise and try to go back, they see that they're being watched by one of the clowns. So in response, decide to all hide inside of a small cramped RV, because sure, why not make the clowns' jobs easier for them? It's not like we've seen they enjoy setting things on fire or anything. But hey, who am I to judge? I've never been stalked by killer clowns, I just talk about people who have. Unsurprisingly, the clowns begin breaking into the RV, when all of a sudden, this random old dude appears and begins helping them. Cheers, random old dude. And after the clowns find themselves bamboozled by some random pensioner who can materialise out of thin air, he takes them to a warehouse where he's living. The man's name is Frank, and what does Frank do in these uncertain, terrifying times of crisis? Cook some slop. We see that Jill has been taken to the clown's camp, and as she's tied up, injured and crying out for help, a female clown appears and tells her that she's going to make her pretty. Back at the warehouse, we see Brad looking at his engagement ring, because there's no better time to propose than after seeing a man be barbecued alive, your friend kidnapped, and a fresh can of slop cooking on the stove. Frank gives some backstory to the characters, explaining how a gang of evil clowns could terrorise an entire town without any repercussions, saying that back in the day, the town used to be a bustling train hub full of jobs and opportunities, but 15 years ago, after a horrific train accident, the jobs left and the people quickly followed. Around the same time, a rather strange uptick in disappearances began occurring, but due to the economic troubles of the town, people had just assumed that they'd gotten up and left instead of being horrifically murdered by clowns, that is. And I guess people just sort of gave up after the disappearances carried on happening, explaining why there's no one about in the town, and why the clowns move around committing their horrific acts so brazenly. And judging by the brief glimpse we get of a picture on the wall, in its full 480p glory, it looks as if Frank's son was the kid who supposedly killed his babysitter 15 years ago. They suddenly hear the clowns enter the building, and new guy, who is apparently named Dylan, is grabbed by one of the clowns and pulled into a room where the door locks behind him. This rather forceful game of seven minutes in heaven comes to an end as Dylan comes face to face with a clown, before quickly becoming face to face with his crowbar as he thrusts it through his cheek, pulls it out, and stabs him in the gut. Another clown appears as the others are attempting to break down the door, and are forced to split off into two groups, because they must really like Scooby-Doo. Frank and Mike hide in a restroom cubicle, because Frank's just kinda freaky like that, while Brad and Sarah are stalked by the crowbar clown. After checking himself out in the bathroom mirror, and wondering why all of the women seem to run away from him, one of the clowns kicks open the toilet stall doors, but Mike and Frank have apparently unlocked the ability to teleport, and have somehow already gotten out of there. Brad and Sarah make their way onto the roof to hide, but it backfires as Sarah is grabbed from behind, a skill that these clowns have apparently gotten down to a T, and as evident all the way back to the original diner scene, Brad isn't afraid to stand up for Sarah, and immediately tackles the clown to the ground as it just kinda lays there letting Brad punch him in the face, almost as if he kinda likes it. 
gross. But it doesn't seem to be doing it for Mr. Clown Man, as he suddenly decides to not lie there and take it, and tries to throw him off the roof, giving Sarah the opportunity to hit him over the head with his own crowbar. And apparently, Brad feels the same way as Sarah, as he takes the crowbar and begins violently connecting the end of it with the man's skull repeatedly, like really repeatedly, not falling into the old movie trope of just leaving the psychopathic mass murderer alive, giving him the opportunity to kill you instead. Yeah, he'd have a bit of a hard time doing that on account of not having a skull anymore. They reunite with Frank and Mike on the roof, and discover Jill's phone in the pocket of the clown who went and lost his head, coming to the realisation that this clown was the busboy back in the diner, and they've been targets ever since visiting it. With directions from Frank, Brad, Sarah and Mike take Dylan's car and head off looking for Jill. But on the way, they spot Frank, somehow now ahead of them, and in the middle of the road, despite being left back on foot in town, sporting his teleportation ability that he learned back in the toilet cubicle. After getting out of the car, Brad realises that Frank's been beaten and stabbed, and as he falls to his knees, another clown appears and begins trying to get Sarah in the car. Now I was almost certain that Frank was going to have something to do with these clowns, with him being the father of the creepy clown Michael Myers kid back in the beginning of the movie. Like maybe they would all be his sons and he would end up leading the group directly towards them, but no, he did. Sarah and Mike are forced to split up from Brad as the clown chases Brad into the woods. He makes it to the Strode residence, the same house from the beginning of the movie, and begins knocking on the front door. He's let into the house by a weird old woman who also seems to have the power of teleportation because now she's sitting in a rocking chair facing away from Brad. What is it with the old people in this movie? After asking the woman for help, she tells Brad that he should just stay here because her son will be back soon and that he'll be able to help him. Yeah, be able to hack your insides up with a cleaver. After seeing the same photo on the wall that Frank had back in his warehouse, Brad realises that she was his wife and that her son is one of the clowns. And it also turns out that it was the mother who killed the babysitter and she did it in front of her children, more than likely causing the spark that would turn her son into a homicidal clown fetishist murderer. Yeah, that'll do that. Brad hides as the clown returns home, and after noticing their rather strange mother-son relationship as she slaps him across the face for no reason, Brad watches as the clown leaves. We see Mike and Sarah headed back to town, with them betting that's where Brad will head, and notice the clowns arrive while driving in a garbage truck, because after you kill off all of your town's residents, I guess someone's gotta keep the place clean. After the clowns get out, Mike and Sarah decide to steal the truck, but find themselves being stolen by the clowns instead. They're taken and held captive at the same place as Jill, and Mike wakes up, restrained to a chair with his hands nailed into it, while Jill and Sarah sit on the floor in front of him. Mike begins screaming at the clowns, demanding to be set free, when suddenly the sheriff appears and knocks him to the ground. The same sheriff from the diner where the friends saw the busboy. I guess they handle all of the jobs around here. Garbage men, busboys and cops. Well, I guess it comes in handy to be able to cover up and clean up the mess you left behind after you horrifically murder a bunch of people while cosplaying as Bozo the Clown. Jill begins screaming as well. After being told to shut her up by the sheriff, one of the clown walks over to her and hits her across the face with a baseball bat, cracking her head open in the process. Which in turn causes the sheriff to begin screaming, because I guess everybody's just screaming now, with him saying that he's done covering up their messes and that he's done looking out for them. So in response, the clown casually stabs him in the gut with a large sadistic smile displayed across his face. Brad suddenly appears, after either figuring out Frank's secret teleportation powers, or following the garbage truck back from town, and begins to free Sarah and Mike. And as he's attempting to get Mike free, but struggling on account of his hands being literally nailed into the chair, the female clown appears. But Sarah knocks her unconscious before she even has a chance to do anything. The clown begins walking towards them as they're trying to free Mike. But the police officer, somehow still alive, shoots the clown twice, which of course does absolutely nothing but anger him, causing him to finish him off with a baseball bat. Because this clown is simply too evil to die. Two other clowns begin to approach, so Mike forces his hands free with the nail still in them, and thrusts them into the neck of a clown, killing him, but ends up taking an axe to the back by another. Brad and Sarah find the garbage truck, but the clowns grab onto them before they can leave. But Mike, simply too badass to die, hits one of them from behind, and forces him into the back of the garbage truck, enabling the crushers right before falling to the ground and dying and Brad kicks the other one away, giving him and Sarah the opportunity to drive away from them. And as they're driving away, with it somehow being incredibly bright outside, despite it being quite literally the opposite of that a few minutes ago, we see two clowns watching them as they leave, presumably the two Strode kids. 
And with the movie coming to an end, Clown Town surprisingly wasn't actually as awful as I thought it might be. When it comes to the channel, I cover a wide variety of films, each with their own wide varying quality levels. And if I were to place Clown Town, then I'd have to sit it somewhere in the middle. It's one I came across after researching clown related horror movies, after the little rabbit hole I've been digging myself deeper and deeper into over the last few months, and the deeper into the rabbit hole you tend to venture, the weirder things tend to get. And remember, weird doesn't always mean good. Before we finish up, I just want to remind you guys that I've got a Twitter, so if you want to stay up to date with future projects or just see whatever stuff I'm up to, make sure you check that out and give me a follow. And before we do bring this thing to an end, I would just like to give a big shout out to all of my patrons, people who on a monthly basis help make this thing happen. So a big thank you to Dom, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Jared CBs, Pascal Mathis, Fighting the Pirates, Richard McGowan III, Macy J, Reese Harford, Chris, Michelle, Dennis, Wade Knott, Ashley L. Wintz, Christopher Butsky, Joshua Torres, Billy Kyle, Remy, Fire Goes Fast, Josh Brooks, Ash Kamahara, Dyreen, Robert Zerwek, Dark Shiva, Josh Hannon, Linda Martinez, Billy Whitaker, Kadaf Lopez, Lonif, Jay Slows, Daniel Dickinson, and Donnie Do Work. So once again, a big thank you to all of my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.